Let's get some more analysis on this and speak to Sorab Ahmadi, an editorial writer at the Wall Street Journal. Many thanks for joining us, Sorab. In your analysis, how has this how has this deal gone down one year later? Well, I think we should first look at uh, Iran's major obligations because, after all, it was Iran whose nuclear weapons program uh, was and remains a threat to, to security in the Middle East and, and to world order. And on that front, um, it's Iran that's, that's uh, been the party that's violated its obligations already by uh, uh, testing ballistic missiles. And it was John Kerry's fault, for example, for not incorporating the question of ballistic missiles, which are part and parcel of Iran's uh, nuclear weapons program into the into the final deal and creating a separate United Nations Security Council resolution, which Iran immediately violated with a number of, of missile tests. So that was the first violation. Iran's behavior in the region continues to be aggressive, from the seizure of the sailors to its continued support for uh, groups like Hezbollah and Hamas. So. Uh, all in all, uh, it's a pattern of Iranian violations that, that I think uh, the world should be worried about and that signal that this deal is, has already failed. You weren't in favor of this deal, were you? I was not. I, th I was a critic. I, I, I wasn't uh, opposed to all diplomacy. I think that has its place. But I think what I saw in this deal and what it's panning out, and I, I feel like um, I and other critics of the deal have been vindicated is that the deal in the lead up to the negotiations w was a series of concessions by the West. So um, delisting from sanctions lists not only uh, aspects of the Iranian economy that were involved with uh, the nuclear program but also uh, just Islamic Revolutionary Guards terrorists and Hezbollah terrorists and the like. So that was one concession. As I mentioned the failure to include uh, ballistic missiles as a component of the nu nuclear deal was another concession. The fact, most important, I think, that the deal has a very quick sunset clause. Various restrictions on Iran's uh, nuclear weapons program expire uh, between 8 to 15 years, and after that, the regime is scot-free. Um, so the, the hope that the, the, the deal rests on is that within that period, there would be some dramatic change within the structure of the regime, and there's no evidence to believe why that should happen. So in 15 years, they can, they can rush to a nuclear weapon, and the world will be just as unsafe as, they, as it was before this deal. We have two critical elections coming up, one in the U.S. and, of course, in Iran in 2017. How, how do you see that playing into how this deal pans out? Well, on the Iranian side, I think that uh, there's too much hope placed in the so-called elections that the regime runs. Um, so uh, the, the popularly elected, quote-unquote, uh, branches of the Iranian government have little say over the direction of foreign policy, security policy, and matters like that. All they do is execute the will of the unelected, unaccountable branches of the government, the supreme leader, the security apparatus, and so forth. So when people say, oh, X, Y, Z, moderate, or whoever could get elected, I think most of it is just a, a, a waste of time and a fool's errand to pay too much atten attention to that. I think on the U.S. side, it, it is more consequential because I think no matter who gets elected, neither of the two uh, leading candidates, uh, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, will ever be as forgiving and as conciliatory as the Obama administration was with this regime. So I think that either way you'll see tough enforcement, uh, tougher en enforcement, and possibly a, re a renegotiation of the deal. Okay, many thanks for your analysis. Shorad Amari, editorial writer at the Wall Street Journal, yeah. there for us in London.